Hey guys, welcome to the latest episode of the Sim Racing Paddock Podcast. I'm William Marsh, and I am here with special guest Ross Bentley, author of the Speed Secrets a series of books, and he's been a well-pedigreed racing driver, and he also runs the Speed Secrets website as well as podcast. So, Ross, I'd like to thank you for coming out here today. I'm looking forward to talking about sim, uh, the sim world. Yeah. So, like, one thing I was noticing before is that, yeah, you've talked a little bit about sort of the carryover between the real world and sim racing, and we've really been noticing that in this latest day and age of sort of being cooped up in our homes, we've been seeing more and more real race car drivers sort of getting into the sim racing world. So one of the things I was wondering was, what was your thought on that? Well, uh, uh, I guess going back a little ways, years ago, I was I was not a big fan of the sim world. Uh, and mostly that was because, you know, early on, it was just so, you know, the graphics were not great, the audio was okay, and any kind of feedback whatsoever was just non-existent. And so it was like, uh, you know, it, it's a good game, but it's not really a very useful tool. But I would say, you know, I don't know, five, maybe eight years ago, you know, the graphics started getting better. And then everything else has gotten better. And, you know, probably in the last five, six years, I've been a huge proponent of using simu simulators for, for training. And, uh, and now, obviously, we're kind of... Uh, unfortunately, forced into that world a little bit. And uh, I've been, I guess, pleasantly surprised, first of all, at how entertaining and good the racing has been, especially like like IndyCar races on NBC have been like, wow, this is this is fantastic stuff. So I think it's it's um, uh, it, it's just exciting to see that world being exposed to more people. The interesting thing, I think, is noticing how some drivers have adapted really well and some drivers have really struggled with it. And, you know, some of it's that whole, you know, digital native, uh, you know, um, you, you know, and, and interestingly, some very young drivers, but they just didn't spend a lot of time on simulators early on in their career or at all. You know, they went from karting into cars and they didn't spend a lot of time in simulators and they've kind of struggled a little bit. And, you know, and then there's some older drivers who have been using simulators for years and they're right up to speed immediately. So I, I think it's fascinating. It's interesting. And, I, you know, I have a lot of kind of ideas about kind of the why some people adapt better than others. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's just it's, it's really interesting to watch. And again, I think it's a huge, valuable tool. So. All right. Well, thank you. And one of the interesting things I found you were talking about, like some of the open wheel racing series, and I was feeling like that also sort of ties into some of your background. So maybe for some of the people who aren't aware of who you are or your background in history, uh, would you care to maybe share about your racing past and sort of your racing journey in general for uh, people who might not know who Ross Bentley is? Well, yeah, I just uh, I just started driving like two months ago. So, <laughs> uh, no, uh, the 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 long story short is, you know, I grew up at the racetrack from the time I was five years old. My dad building race cars and uh, and just always wanted to race Indy cars, Formula One, you know, sports cars, Le Mans, you know, all of that kind of stuff. And uh, you, you know, finally got to a point where I was racing Indy cars in the early ninety, early to mid nineties. And which was one of the more challenging times to be in Indy cars because it was the competitiveness of it at that time. Uh, drove for the smallest budget team, had no money, kind of really struggled trying to get, uh, you know, always had an uncompetitive car and kind of struggled, but hoping to make that next breakthrough and never quite got that. But that led to, you know, a few phone calls from teams, IMSA sports car teams and you know, got invites to go and test and then got hired to drive sports cars and prototype sports cars. And, and, uh, I gotta tell you, getting paid to drive race cars, greatest scam in the world. 
so, you know, drove in IMSA, IMSA and the various version of Grand Am, American Le Mans series, IMSA, all of those things through that, through that period for a bunch of years. But also very early on learned that I love to coach drivers and help other drivers get the same kind of feelings and thrills that I got out of, I, I get out of the sport. And so I started coaching and I'd say, I mean, I started instructing in the 1980s and I started coaching in the late 90s. And to me, there's a difference between instructing and coaching and, you know, really got into the mental game. And that sort of became my sweet spot because I was always driving for low budget teams. I needed to find some way to get an advantage or at least try to equalize things. So the mental game part of it and the whole sports psychology, and I really studied sports psychology and neuroscience, and I'm kind of a learning junkie. So when I get into something, I got to learn everything about it. So, um, yeah, and, and then just have been able to apply all of that sort of my experience in various cars and racing and my study of coaching and how people learn and how drivers perform and things. And, you know, fortunately, I've had a chance to work with a lot of drivers through the years. And because of that, uh, in, in some ways, they've been sort of my lab rats. You know, I, I try something on them. I experiment with them and it either works or doesn't work. And I have learned to do that. And fortunately, I get a chance to travel all over the world and work with drivers that, from first timers on the track to elite level, you know, a lot of drivers that you would know the names of, whether they're at Le Mans or Indy 500 or um, you name it. I mean, I've worked with drivers in NASCAR, motorcycle, super bikes and flat track motorcycle racing, drag racing. Uh, so I've had a chance to work with a lot of different disciplines. And I guess that's kind of helped me uh, hone in on what has what works and what doesn't work most often. So that's right. the that's the. Uh, attempt to be a long story short, probably a little longer than you needed. <laughs> hey, well, it's great to hear it. And also, I just want to say on behalf of the sim racing community, thank you for just sharing all of that, because I will go around to different sim racing forums and people looking to get their start and learn driving techniques. And I always hear people recommending the Speed Secrets books, like the Speed Secrets books, the going faster series by the skip barber racing school yeah and i will be honest i have not fully read the speed secrets books yet but i do want to go check them out uh soon so maybe that will help me learn a thing or two because uh, as some of my viewers know i might definitely need the help but yeah <laughs> so let's sort of shift over to sort of the sim racing side so you yep. were talking about how you have become a proponent of sim racing, especially in the past five to 10 years. So what would you say would be sort of one of the biggest things that sim racing carries over to the real world? Well, the, the first thing, the first obvious one is uh, where sim racing has an advantage is you can do it for eight hours a day mm -hmm. and, and you cannot do that on a real racetrack just <laughs> cost accessibility all those things right so i think that that is a huge um uh, a huge benefit one of the things that i talk about in terms of sort of the mental side of of driving is you know if you think about it your brain is a little bit like a computer you put bad information into a computer, you're going to get bad output. You know, it's the old garbage in, garbage out thing. And, you know, you flip that around, you put good quality in, you get good quality out. Well, one of the things that the best drivers do better than other drivers is they take better quality uh, sensory information in. So visually, they take in better quality information. They take in better quality auditory information. They hear things, they notice things just a little bit better and they feel things more. Well, obviously within the sim world, visual stuff, and that's where, like I said, there seemed to be a, like a tipping point with the graphics a number of years ago, where the graphics got good enough where that, that became a really good learning tool. And so I think one of the things that sim racers are really good at, and they apply to when they get into a, 
I hate calling it a real car because it makes it sound like sim is not real. I mean, it is real. It's just a different kind. But I'll, so I'll say real car. But when they get into that real car, um, they're really good at picking up visual cues. And they're really good at picking up the auditory cues because they have to, because they don't have that feel, that kinesthetic. They don't have the G-forces. Uh, anytime that you kind of restrict some senses or other senses sort of come in and try to make up the difference. So when a sim racer gets on a track in a real car, it's almost like they're more sensitive to that feel and they've learned how to drive without it. Now that's like the brain's going, oh, thank you. Now we have all this feel as well. So I think that's one of the advantages that sim racing has. And it, you, know, you can take that and especially if you deliberately practice using the visual and auditory cues and trying to pick up any kind of feel you get back through the, the force feedback in the wheel or the pedals or vibrations that come through auditory or, or if you've got a motion uh, sim rig, um, you know, you pick up the little bits of that and you use that. I think that's a big, big part of it. So while sims don't have the same level of sensory input, if you use that to your advantage, it's actually a benefit when you get on track. Hmm. That is an interesting perspective to take about it because I have heard about how there are some of the indie car drivers, especially like in some of the races where uh, there was a notable one. I want to say it might have been Joseph Newgarden or someone like that. And he was spinning and he was saying that he just... He would never spin at that specific corner at Barber Motorsport Park in real life. Yep. So from a driving instructor pers uh, perspective, uh, I'm kind of curious on what you would say, like if you've seen the clip, might have been like, what would maybe lead to that kind of like distancing between the sim and the real world? So... I, I think there are, you know, different drivers sense the limits of their car in different ways. Uh, I have coached some drivers who come from a sim racing background that get, then got into cars. And they tend to drive the car, I, I call it, they drive the car off the front tires. Because in a sim, you know, you turn the wheel and you can sense understeer a lot easier. You know, you kind of turn in and it's almost like you want to generate a little understeer because then you can work with that. But you really, it's hard to sense the rear because you don't have that yaw in the sim. And uh, so I think sim racers tend to sense the car off the front tires. Some, some professional race drivers drive the car off the front tires, but a lot of them drive it off the rear tires meaning they're sensing the limit off of that. When's the rear going to move? When's the rear going to move? When's the rear? And if you don't have that in the sim, you're, you're at a disadvantage. And I think drivers like New Garden, and I'd say Alexander Rossi, they drive the car off the rear tires. And you watch them drive an Indy car, and they're not afraid to have the car step out and have the car a little sideways in places. In a sim, they don't have that same sense of yaw. And so I think that that's... Um, uh, it's a disadvantage to them. Now you could get another driver. Will Power is very good. Now some of it is, I'd say, Will Power is probably spent more time in a simulator than New Gardner or Rossi has. But I think his driving style is he drives the car off the front of the t front tires all the time, anyways, and therefore in a sim he doesn't lack that last tiny little bit of feedback that a guy like New Garden might. I don't know if that answers your question, but uh, it, it's it's. I think it's a fascinating kind of way of looking at the differences between the two and why some drivers are, you know, I, I think you can take some race drivers who have never been in a simulator, put them in a simulator and they'll be fast right away. And I think other drivers, you'll put them in and they'll really struggle. And it doesn't mean that they're a better or worse driver. They're just different. And, you know, yeah, you look at a guy like Lando Norris, who has been in a sim since he was five or six years old. And he obviously can sense the car better than a lot of drivers who, who, who get in a sim and can't feel that. Yeah, 
that's definitely an interesting perspective because yeah, it's something where it's sort of your upbringing and the way you drive and where you basically have uh, what you're used to and then you're thrust into this totally different thing. So to an extent, would you almost say that going into a simulator is almost like having to learn a new car in some senses? Absolutely. You're dead on right there. And, and I think, you know, what some drivers have to do is adapt their driving style and intentionally uh, induce a little bit of understeer because that, that's how they're going to sense where the limit is because they're going to they're only going to feel it in the steering wheel. And for some drivers, that means changing how they release the brake pedal. It's the, you know, the the probably the number one thing that I work with with drivers on is the timing and rate of release of the brakes. And if you release the brakes a little quicker, you know, you tend to kind of get the car, the front of the car unloaded a little sooner. The car starts to understeer a bit and then you work with that understeer. But if you're a driver who tends to trail brake into a corner and kind of use that, um, you use that weight transfer to the front to get the car to rotate and then drive the car off the rear of tires, you're going to have to learn to adapt your driving style to not use that style because it's going to be it's going to be more difficult to be fast in a sim with that style. And you know, for some drivers, they go, "Well, see, that's why simulators are not accurate and why I don't care about them because they're not teaching me what I need to know." And I'd say, actually, that's not true because there's going to come a day where you're going to drive a car where that is the driving style that you need, and using the simulator to develop that style is just a fantastic opportunity. So why wouldn't you do it in a sim? So I, I, I think it's a, I, again, it's a great tool to help a driver learn different techniques. I think the drivers that have the biggest toolboxes, the toolbox of you know more tools or more strategies, styles, techniques, they're gonna be more adaptable and they're gonna be more consistently fast. If you have one style to go fast, and it works for that one car on that track that day, great, you're gonna be fast. But some other time in another car, another track, that's not gonna be the fastest way. And again, simulators are fantastic places to allow you to experiment and have all the time in the world to go, now I'm gonna try this style, now I'm gonna work with this style, now I'm gonna work with this style. So it's great for that. Yeah, and that's one of the things I definitely find interesting because yeah, one of the greatest blessings you touched on with sim racing is that you get unlimited testing time because yeah. now in these, or especially since the early 2000s, a lot of racing series have drastically cut down on their like active open track testing. So we, I still remember seeing the Red Bull racing simulator for Formula One, watching Sebastian Vettel and uh, Mark Webber testing yeah. out laps and I always found that impressive. So one question I have is, do you think that in the world of sim racing, we might see the next generation of active racing drivers, like predominantly coming from sim racing as opposed to say arting or lower tier formula series? Uh, for sure, we're going to see some of that. I don't know whether it's going to be, uh, you know, if it's going to be that's all they've ever done. You know, if somebody came to me right now and said, hey, I have a five-year-old, turn them into a future world champion, they would be on a simulator every day. But they would also be in a go-kart, and they'd also be on a motorcycle, uh, because, and they'd also be on skis, and they'd be on a mountain bike, because I think you need a lot of that the developing the sense of balance that you don't get in a sim. So I think if if all somebody ever did was only spend time in a sim and not develop their sense of balance, I don't think they're going to be at that, you know, that very very peak. Uh, but I think the days of drivers not using simulators, that's that's long gone now. I think that you know and, and you know look at Formula 1 today. You know, you look at guys like Leclerc for stopping Lando Norris, uh, Albon, you know, these are guys that grew up with Sims and that is going to be the, that that's going to be, they're going to have to do that. 
and you know as a sport gets you know it's not going to get any cheaper so i think you know a lot of a lot of development is being done you know I, i've worked with drivers where the car development is being done on a simulator and because it's you know, it's less expensive to run a simulator than it is uh, going to a track and so i think you know most of the car development is going to be done and most of it already is now anyways um, but you know it's just going to be the last little fine tuning for track conditions that are going to is is what happens at the track now right. so that interesting element where you're talking about like the five-year-old make him world champion that brings me to another interesting thought slash question that pops in my head so imagine there's a guy maybe 16 years old and he says i've been racing simulators for 10 years what do i need to do to make it in the real world so i'm curious what would you say would be something that would be like a potential hurdle that he would need to overcome. So again, kind of going back to the the sense of balance, um, it, you know. So the first question would be, what is that sixteen year old's kind of kinesthetic feel, uh, um, sensing ability like? And you know, if they've been active in a lot of other sports, it's probably really good. But if they don't have that, I would say, you know, you need to spend time in a go-kart. Again, go-kart, mountain bike, dirt bike, um, skiing, things like that that are going to sort of work that kinesthetic part of it. And I would I would say that's only going to help what they have already learned from the simulator. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, um, sim racing – also, you know, we're right now, mostly we've been talking about just outright speed. The other thing that, you know, sim racing is obviously good for is the whole race craft, the wheel to wheel passing, being passed part of it. And there's a, there's, you know, there's a good and a bad about that, right? And uh, so I think racing wheel to wheel in go-karts will teach somebody kind of how much you can get away with, you know, in a sim, you know. Realistically, you can get away with anything. And it was interesting uh, watching uh, w watching Lando Norris's Twitch channel and watching how verbal he is when he's racing wheel to wheel with other drivers. And, you know, there's a little bit of, you know, I caught something where uh, he and Verstappen were going into a corner, you know, some, I can't remember where, where this thing was, but... Um, you know, he tries a pass around the outside and Verstappen saying, nobody passes me on the outside. And there's kind of this conversation going on. And I'm like, that's a, that's, a, there's a whole culture there of, I can get away with this because it's a sim. And you watch them race in Formula One and there's a little bit of it there. Like there are no consequences to them. And, it, you know, I don't want to sound like the old fuddy-duddy kind of guy, but it is one of the reasons why old Formula One drivers say, you know, the, young, the younger generation just don't understand, you know. I, I, when I raced, you know, that was back in the days when, you know, m more than one driver would die every year. And because of that, because racing has become so safe, uh, these drivers don't quite have that same level of respect in the wheel-to-wheel -wheel stuff. And that's why I'd say racing go-karts will teach some of that. You know, you need to have a, a balance of those things. What I like about sim racing is it teaches you to try some things <laughs> that maybe you wouldn't try in real life. So, again, with respect and getting a good balance in those things, I think that's really important. But that's why I'd say racing carts is still still, still important. Yeah, right. I had a friend who raced carts and... I did a karting school over at uh, what was Jim Russell. Now, I guess it's Sonoma Performance Driving or something like that. Right, yeah, right. It used yeah. to be Sim Raceway. Now it changed again. So, yeah. Yeah, but actually that class, I had this wreck over at the final turn at the Sonoma Car Track. And mm. the guy behind me spun, didn't lock his brakes, climbed up on the side and 
the rear tire was a few inches from my elbow. And that gave me a whole new kind of respect for what happens in an accident and sort of the risk versus reward system. So kind of yeah. going from that, you do get that sense of danger and also a sense of the limits, what you can push, what you can't. So yeah. All right. I think might have time for a couple more questions. So if you had one major tip to say to a sim racer to try to improve his driving ability, what would you say is the most important element to sort of help a driver improve his racing ability in lap times? So I, I'm assuming that this is a driver who is pretty good and fairly experienced. Uh, I would say it's the same thing I would say if a driver walked up to me today and said, I'm racing on the track this weekend, and it would be focus on the timing and rate of release of the brake pedal. And the timing being, when do you start to release in relationship to when do you turn in? So it could be, you could start, start releasing the brake pedal, start easing up on the brake pedal before you turn in, right as you turn in or after you turn in. And then the rate is, is it a quick release or is it a slow release? And you know, the great thing about a sim is that you could go on the track and you could just do some laps and say, I'm gonna do a bunch of laps where I release the brake pedal really quickly. Now I'm gonna do some where I release it really slowly as I come into the corners and just experiment and try different timings and rates of release of the brakes. And the other thing kind of related to that that I would do is I would actually set up a little, you know, set your smartphone or a video camera or whatever up and point it at your hands and your feet and maybe have the monitor um, in the background, but really just have, just so you can kind of see where you are on the track, but have it so that you can see what you're doing with your hands and your feet. And then watch that afterwards. And because a lot of times when I'm coaching a driver on a sim, I will actually have that. I mean, if I'm doing it in person or if I'm remotely, I will have that set up so I can watch their feet. And a lot of times, a lot of drivers are surprised at what their feet are doing. They were like, you know, I'm really smooth and slow with my brake release. And then they watch and they go, oh, hmm, maybe not so much. Um, so, you know, it just helps build that awareness in you know, again, and a great thing about a sim is that you could go through a corner and if you've got a camera set up recording this, as you're going through the corner, you could say, I'm going to, I'm going to have a slow release and I'm slow releasing and the car is rotating nicely, or you can actually talk and record that and then go back and watch and listen to that afterwards and go, Hey, when I release the brakes like this, the car does that. And when I release the brakes like that, the car does this. So it's a, just a great, great learning tool. I think sometimes and sorry, but I think sometimes sim racers or drivers in in uh, all drivers, when they get on a sim, they get overly caught up in the what lap time can I turn or what position can I get into? And they don't use it as a practice tool and they don't use it in a very deliberate way. And if you just say, OK, for the next hour, all I'm going to work on is my brake release and I'm going to do it in these different ways, you're going to become a better driver more quickly. All right. That is some great advice. And that is definitely something I need to work on because I feel like myself at times I'm a little one note in my brake releases. So that I think is some advice that you're, yeah, I could definitely use. So one last question, and I think I'm going to have this as sort of the topic or not topic, but the good closing question for my series of interviews Imagine you have a computer and a racing setup right in front of you, loaded up with every sim racing game known to man. What do you pick? Oh, which which uh, platform you mean? Or yeah, what title would you pick as your like racing for fun? Uh, well, I I think well I the the, the default I think is iRacing and. Part of that is because iRacing has most of the tracks that I go to in North America, uh, and they have them, I'd say, they seem more realistic to me than some of the other ones do. 
the challenge is that I do a lot of coaching uh, in other series and everything where, you know, for example, I want an LMP3 car. Well, sorry, but iRacing doesn't have that. A set of course it does, you know. So what I end up doing is I kind of flip around and find, you know, sometimes I might be in a set of Corsa with an LMP3 car. The track maybe on that track is not the best track. So I'll, I'll practice and use that car and, you know, in a set of Corsa. And then when I want to work on the track stuff, I'll use iRacing in a different car that's close, but not quite the same. So I tend to flip around, but understand I'm not a, I'm not a sim racer. Yeah. I'm a, I'm a coach <laughs> and my job is to help other drivers perform better. So I come from at a slightly different angle. I'm, and you know, I, again, I use, I use sims as a, as a training tool, not as a place that I go and compete in. So I'm a, I'm a little different that way. All right. In many ways, but that would definitely that way. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, but it's a great, great question. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's definitely an interesting angle and it's one that is greatly appreciated because yeah, with coaching, it's definitely great to hear some tips and tricks on how to improve and just be or get more out of your racing experience. So yeah, I, again, I just want to thank you again for just taking the time out of your day, out of your lockdown to just spend time like in this interview. I appreciate it. it it's fun. Uh, it, it, well, it's fun talking about simulation because it is something that I'm, I'm getting more and more. I'm, I'm using more and more as a tool as well. So, um, uh, you know, I was tell people it's all about learning and having fun. And a sim is a great place to do that, whether we're on lockdown or not. All right. And yeah, I'll just give you a brief minute to also just pitch your website. I believe you also have a podcast as well. And yeah, just anything else you'd like people to know about. I mean, uh, at speedsecrets.com, that's my website. And it's kind of the, you know, I try to make it the one central source for everything from free driving tips to eBooks to webinars, uh, both free and paid for ones, live ones, recorded ones. I do a series with another coach I call Virtual Track Walks, where we spend an hour or two or three going into the little tiny granular details of how to get around a track. So if you're doing a sim race at whatever, Road America or Lime Rock or Laguna Seca this weekend, that virtual track walk would make you a faster driver because it'll give you all the tools for that. So that that's my central source for everything. Um, I'm on all the, well, not all. I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And, uh, you know, follow me there because I put out tips. And, oh, and YouTube. I'm putting more and more uh, videos out on YouTube these days as well. So um, follow me there. The podcast, I put on a little bit of a hiatus for a little while, but it's coming back. I keep telling people it's coming back. I've got a, a few of them recorded, and I'm going to, get some new ones coming up there pretty soon. So uh, watch for the Speed Secrets podcast and whatever you're doing there too. So there you go, speedsecrets.com. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you again, Ross, for this great, great interview. And yeah, guys, so this wraps up the first interview of the Sim Racing Paddock podcast. And I hope you enjoyed. And yeah, just let me know who else you would like me to interview, but I really hope you did enjoy this interview as much as I enjoyed filming it. But yeah, guys, for the Sim Racing Paddock, I'm William Marsh, and thanks for watching.